Dr. Raul Rio Centeno was stumped. He was a doctor in Lima, Peru, and one day a woman came into his office with a case of hemiplegia, meaning one half of her body was paralyzed. He examined her, um, couldn't find anything wrong with her, brain scan looked normal, but she couldn't move half her body. It was a mystery. But when she told her story about what happened to her, that's when things went from mysterious to straight up weird. According to this woman, it all happened when she and her friend were camping in the Marcahuasi Stone Forest, which is about 60 kilometers from Lima. It's like a plateau in the Andes Mountains with some really crazy looking rock formations, so they call it a, a stone forest. Um, hey, that looks like a creepy face. That's fun. So this woman and her friend were sleeping next to that and decided to, you know, go explore a little bit at night. You know, like a horror movie. And as they were exploring, they began to hear music and eventually saw some lights off in the distance. They seemed to be coming from a, an old cabin. And as they got closer, they saw that there were people like dancing inside of this old cabin. People that were like dressed in 17th century clothing. And the music they were dancing to was from that time period too. So the front door of this cabin was open as they approached it and this woman couldn't help herself. She wanted to know what was going on. So she stuck her head in the door and just immediately collapsed to the floor. Her friend pulled her away and tried to help her up, but that's when they both realized that she couldn't move half her body. So they kind of stumbled back to their camp uh, with her friend helping her get there. And when they got there, they found a park ranger and told him what happened back at that cabin. This park ranger, of course, had no idea what they were talking about. There was no cabin in that area, at least not anymore. So the good Dr. Centeno heard this story and um, just had no idea what to do for this patient at this point. I mean, he was a well-trained doctor. He's a smart guy, but you know, he didn't really spend a lot of time in medical school talking about intertemporal space-time slippages. So he chose to just kind of monitor her for a while and, and see how she did. And evidently, yeah, she got better. She improved. Eventually she made a full recovery. But this is, is one of those stories. It is a story that has been passed around the internet that claimed to be proof of parallel universes or interdimensional travel. The idea being that there are multiple, possibly infinite parallel universes and timelines outside of our reality. And sometimes, sometimes those two universes connect with each other. Meaning sometimes we can see into a parallel universe like in that story, or it can mean that sometimes a person or people from one parallel universe can just appear in ours, which is exactly what seems to have happened in the story of the man from Taurad. At a special session of the British Parliament in 1960, the House of Commons was engaged in a heated debate over immigration and passport reform. Like this was in the early days of the Cold War, Spying was a big problem and air traffic was, was now growing. It was a whole thing. Um, they needed to update their security. So one member of parliament stepped forward. His name was Robert Matthew. Uh, he went up to argue that passports were not enough for sufficient security. He wanted extra protections. And to help make this point, he referenced a story that he and his team had just heard about of a security breach that happened in Japan. Apparently the bloke got into the country with a passport from a country that doesn't exist. A bit weird, isn't it? Hand me my bottle of water. Thank you. This country that didn't exist, according to Matthew, was called Tared. And this is where the legend of the man from Tared was born. As legends often do, the story morphed over time. Details were added, embellishments here and there. It eventually wound up in a popular book that came out in 1979 called Into Thin Air, People Who Disappear by a guy named Paul Begg. From here, it would float around various mystery-oriented magazines and book compilations, radio shows, that kind of thing. But it was when the internet arrived that the story really took off. Many consider the man from Tarred's story to be one of the most convincing parallel universe stories ever told. I mean, they talked about it at the House of Commons, for crying out loud. And there's a reason why it's such a popular story. Because there's actually a little bit of truth behind it. Okay, I've talked around the story. Here's what the actual story is, in case you don't know. It's a hot day in Tokyo in July 1954. A man arrives at the Haneda airport. He's Caucasian, average looking. I feel like they're describing me. I'm very average looking. Also very Caucasian. So he goes to the counter, pulls out his passport, and the customs officials look at it, and they feel like there's something off about it. The first being that it says he's from a country called Tared, which is not a country they'd ever heard of, at least not in this universe. 
So they question this man and ask him where uh, exactly Tarred is, if he can point to it on a map, and he points to the country of Andorra. Which, in case you're wondering, Andorra is uh, right on the border of Spain and France, and it's a tiny, tiny little country. Right there. Zip. So he points to Andorra, but that's not what he knows it as. He knows it as Tarred, and he tells the officials that it should be there labeled as tar red, and he says that it's been there for over a thousand years. The officials also noticed that he had money from several different European countries. His passport had also been stamped by airports around the world, including previous trips to Tokyo. These officials are now completely confused, they don't know what to make of this guy, so they take him to a local hotel and they put him in a room with two guards stationed outside of it. They start checking his references, they follow up with the company that he claims that he works for, they didn't know who he was. They checked with a hotel that he claimed to have had a reservation with, they had never heard of him either. And the company he was in Tokyo to do business with? That's right, they'd never heard of him either. So, completely confused, still unable to find any answers, the officials went back to the hotel room where they had placed him, and when they opened the door, he was gone. This room was several stories up, and there wasn't a balcony. There's no way he could have jumped out without hurting himself, and the guards never saw him leave. He just flat out disappeared, and was never seen or heard from again. Because aliens. I'm kidding, of course, that's a... That's a crazy thing to say, because he was actually from a parallel universe. So the whole idea of parallel universes was first floated by US physicist Hugh Everett III in 1954. One might notice that's right before the story that we're talking about here. So the basic gist, according to Hugh Everett, is that uh, parallel universes are kind of like a mirror of our universe, but where the outcomes have shifted just a little bit. For example, in this universe, you decide to take a left at the fork in the road. In another universe, you took a right. And that has made all the difference. Uh, maybe another way of putting it, you chose to watch this video. And in making that choice, you created the universe that you now live in, the one in which you watch this video. But there's another you in a parallel universe that chose not to watch this video and instead maybe, I don't know, connect with another human being. Ugh, that sounds awful. And this like splitting of universes that I just described, this takes place with every decision you make, every moment of every day of your life. Like think about how many universes you created just today. Now imagine that for every day of your life. You are right? You're processing that? Okay, well now factor in the idea that like every decision that gets made in every one of those universes spawns its own universe. And every decision in that universe spawns its own universe and on and on and on. Then keep in mind that the exact same thing is happening with every single human being that has ever lived, every animal that has ever lived, and in fact, every atomic interaction that occurs in the entire universe. Infinity, baby! Hugh Everett III was clearly a fan of the Sticky Icky. How does a person come up with this? Well, the answer goes back to our old friend, the double slit experiment. Now, I'm 99% sure that if you watch this channel, you're more than aware of the double slit experiment, but for those of you who are sitting in the back of the class carving that weird S thing into your desk, here's a 30 second version. So way back when, way back when, there was this debate around whether light traveled as a particle, like little bullets of energy, or waves, like rippling through the water. There seemed to be evidence for both. So they came up with a double slit experiment, where they basically shined light at a barrier that had two slits in it, and saw how it projected on the screen behind it. If they got an interference pattern, that would indicate that it moved as waves. If they got two clusters of light, that means they were firing through like particles. They ran the experiment, and they got an interference pattern, so light travels as waves. Interesting. Even more interesting, when they fired the photons through one at a time, they still got an interference pattern, meaning the photons were interfering with themselves. This was basically proof of superposition, basically a particle being in numerous states at once, which is how it's able to interact with itself. But the big one that you've all heard of, the part that broke everybody's brains, was when they set up a measurement device on one of the slits so they could see which slit the photon was going through. And when they did that, the interference pattern broke down, it went away. They wound up getting two clusters of dots again, which means they were now acting as particles. So yeah, something about observing these particles caused them to collapse out of their state of superposition and forced them to choose one state of being. This implication about the quantum world has led to a lot of theories and speculation. Out of that, Werner Heisenberg developed his uncertainty principle that suggests that observing it affects its behavior. And it was actually Niels Bohr that suggested that um, the observation causes the superposition to collapse, which is kind of the thing that we all go on now. Yeah, 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 I know, I'm way over 30 seconds, but Everett agreed with pretty much all of that, but he disagreed with Bohr on the superposition thing. He believed that measuring caused a split in the universe, that the universe literally duplicated itself. So yeah, this goes well beyond the quantum level to um, 
And even like having no action is an action itself. So even no action will split the universe in two, according to Hugh Everett III. Parallel universes also mess with our understanding of time. Because a timeline in this theory wouldn't be a line at all. It'd be more like a, an infinitely splitting tree uh, that would show every single outcome for every single action taken. And for the record, there were some experiments and uh, papers that were done in the 90s that suggest that maybe this is possible, but that's not proof of it. And even if there was proof of it, that doesn't mean that somebody from another universe could just jump into our universe. Right? Because the man from Tarad story um, did actually happen. Sort of. That House of Commons member that I talked about, Robert Matthew, he got it from somewhere. And that somewhere was a real thing that happened. The man from Tarred was a real person. He had a name. His name was John Zegris. At least that was the name on his passport. He was 36, and the incident actually happened in October 1959, not in 1954. Zegris was traveling with his common-law wife, who was Korean. They flew from Taiwan to Japan. Um, but unlike the man from Tarred's story, he wasn't, like, stopped at the airport or whatever. Like, he got into the country with no problems. It was actually three months later that he got in trouble. Uh, that would put it in about early 1960 because he attempted to cash around 350,000 yen worth of traveler's checks at two different Tokyo banks with a fake passport. Yeah, apparently the passport that he had on him was, was kind of amateurish and homemade. Um, it had stamps from other countries, but they were fake. Like, like it was just good enough to get past maybe an inexperienced bank teller. Um, but I'm guessing for 350,000 yen, he got the manager. Did I go through the trouble of figuring out what 350,000 yen in 1959 equates to today? <laughs> yes, I did. I'm that kind of nerd. Okay, so the currency exchange from yen to dollars in 1959 was 360 yen per dollar. So that means he was cashing around $1,000 of traveler's checks. But if you adjust that for inflation, that would be about $11,000 today. So those aren't specific numbers. I rounded quite a bit, but just for context, like that's what he got busted for. So yeah, $11,000 is nothing to sneeze at. So he got arrested and charged with bank fraud. But it wasn't the bank fraud that caused him to make the news and eventually get to the House of Commons. It was the backstory he told the police. First of all, he claimed to be a diplomat from a country called Nagusi Habesi, which is not a real place in this universe. According to Zegris, he was born in the US, moved to Germany, then to Czechoslovakia, and then to England, where he was a fighter pilot in World War II. Did Czechoslovakia exist before World War II? He claimed he was shot down during the war and spent time in the German POW camp. He then lived in South America after the war and became an intelligence agent for the US and Korea. And then he was a fighter pilot again, this time in Thailand, then in Vietnam. And after that, he joined the Arab coalition and apparently became a citizen of Nagusi Habesi, whatever that is. And apparently this country had ordered him to go to Japan to uh, try to recruit volunteers for the Arab coalition. And last but not least, he told the police that he worked for both the CIA and the FBI. Dude got around like Forrest Gump. So yeah, Nagusi Habesi doesn't exist, but he told them that it was south of the Sahara Desert. The authorities tried to verify his claims, even the made-up country, but couldn't find a single thing. Zegers went to court where the judge ruled that he was just a tourist trying to forge traveler's checks with a fake passport, and during his sentencing, he tried to cut his wrists with a piece of glass. It didn't work. Anyway, he was sentenced to one year in a Japanese prison for bank fraud, and his wife was deported back to Korea. Anyway, he served his time, and then after that he went to Hong Kong, uh, and that's where he kind of disappeared. He dropped off the map. No records of him ever come up again. So that's the actual story. And you may have noticed there is something kind of missing from that story. Um, there's no mention of Tared. The word Tared does not come up anywhere in the story. So how is this the same guy? How did Robert Matthew get Tared from Nagusi Habesi? Well, first of all, the timeline adds up. Um, news reports about the whole story started circulating about a month before his sentencing, and that's about when Matthews and his team were looking for, you know, examples of how passports aren't good enough for security. But the theory is that either he or his aides um, basically shortcutted some facts and mistranslated some things. Like in the speech, he mentions Tared, but also the city of Taman Raset, uh, neither of which were mentioned by Zegras or any of the Japanese police. But Zegras mentioned that Nagusi Habesi was south of the Sahara. And Taman Raset is a real place. It's a city in Algeria, kind of right in the middle of the Sahara. Also, interesting, there is a nomadic tribe of people that live in that area. Um, in fact, they're spread across about five different countries in the Sahara Desert, including Taman Raset. And their name is the Tuareg people. In fact, the Volkswagen Tuareg is named after them because they're legendary travelers. 
So it is possible that an aide found a map of Africa that looks something like this, showing the area of the Tureg people where they roamed, and thought that it was a country, and then saw the city of Taman Raset and just jumped to some conclusions. It was a jump to conclusions, Matt. So shoddy work to begin with, but then, you know, Matthews may have seen Tureg and misread it or mispronounced it as Tared, and then an internet legend was born. Now, there are a lot of assumptions and speculations in this story to make it work, but all of them are at least plausible. <laughs> They're a lot more plausible than somebody jumping here from another uh, alternate reality. So there you go. The patented Joe Scott wet towel. But it's still an interesting story, and there's still a lot of mystery around it. Like, what happened to this guy's egress after he got to Hong Kong? Vanished. Man up and vanished like a fart in the wind. So, I mean, there's, there's still a mystery to solve there. And besides, that's the thing about infinite universes. Literally anything can happen. So, maybe the man from Tar Red's story is real. Maybe it really did happen. Just in another universe. The concept of infinite parallel universes is, uh... Difficult. <laughs> Some of the world's br brightest minds struggle with it. So yeah, if you started bleeding from the ear while watching this video, it's totally normal. Disclaimer, I mean that metaphorically. If that's actually happening, you should probably see the doctor. But if you want to get a better handle on the concept of infinity in general, worry not, nerds, because you can find an entire course on infinity at brilliant.org. And because it's brilliant, you know it won't be some boring treatise filled with formulas and equations. You'll be solving puzzles using interactive games and graphics, so the concepts go down like warm honey on a biscuit. A math biscuit. Or maybe you want to learn about things that might be a little bit more helpful in your life, like, say, data analysis. Brilliant has a ton of new courses on data analysis where you can use actual data sets from companies like Airbnb, Spotify, and Starbucks, and use those to help discover trends and understand your world a little bit better. Or with AI inserting itself into every facet of our lives, it might be good to take their course on large language models to get a better understanding of how they work. But even more important, figure out the best uses for them. Brilliant is just a different kind of learning. First of all, it's on your phone, so you can just pop it open and learn in short bursts throughout your day whenever it's convenient to you. And second, it's fun. It's, it's, it's more like playing a game, and because you're using your problem-solving skills, you're learning it all in a way that makes the most sense to you, and it will make it stick so you can apply it to other areas of your life. Like seriously, I always tell people, if there's a subject that you struggled with in school, check it out on Brilliant. You will be amazed how much you can get this time around that you couldn't pick up last time. Anyway, to give Brilliant a try and see all this for yourself, you can check it out for free if you go to brilliant.org slash answerswithjoe or just scan the QR code on screen here. You can try it out for free and you'll get 20% off the premium subscription going forward. It's a great deal and it's a great way to spend your time. Get a little bit smarter. Deal with Brilliant. Link's down below. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. If this is your first time here, welcome. I do videos on topics like this all the time. In fact, I'll put a video up here about another time traveler, the best documented time travel uh, story that's out there. You might you might enjoy it if you like this video. But anyway, watch that video. I think you'll like it or any of the others that might show up on the sidebar over here that Google might be pointing you to that have my name on them. Uh, I invite you to watch them. And if you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday from time to time. <laughs> but I think that's it for now. You guys go out there. Have an eye opening rest of the week. Stay safe and I'll see you next time. Love you guys. Take care. <laughs>